coming up on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. Over the years now, I've been involved in the development of tens of IoT initiatives with my clients, and there's only one thing they all have in common. Every one of them pivoted. And I don't mean little pivots, I mean 180 degree pivots. Lesson here is to pivot fast and pivot early, otherwise there's a good chance you're not going to make it out of pilot purgatory. In this episode of the IoT Business Show, I speak with Phil Regine about his early pivot and the lessons he learned in taking his senior care product to the pilot stage. All this and more on this episode of the IoT Inc. Business Show. The people, the business, and the technology of the next generation internet. This is the IoT Inc. Business Show. And now, here's your host, Bruce Sinclair. Hello and welcome to the IoT Inc. Business Show. This show is for business leaders and managers employing the Internet of Things for their business or the business of their customers. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair, and I interview the industry's leading authorities to find out how they use IoT to improve business and create value. If you like this show, subscribe to it on iTunes and go to iotinc.com to check out my complimentary articles, videos, meetups, and webinars. Turns out there aren't that many experts in AI when applied to IoT. So it's taken me a little bit longer to corral them into the show. But I have an excellent guest to start. Brett Greenstein, he is the VP uh, for Watson IoT at IBM. He'll be the first in the series. But until then, this is an excellent episode with Phil Regine. Phil's a good guy and a longtime listener of the show. And he'll share his experiences in developing an IoT product from scratch to serve the senior care market. If you enjoyed this podcast, consider funding it by becoming a certified IoT professional by completing the IoT Inc. Certified IoT Professional, or ICIP, online training program. It pulls together pretty much everything I know on IoT in the three courses, the ICIP Technology Course, ICIP Business Course, and the ICIP Strategy and Digital Transformation Course, all of which are inside the program. Details about the ICIP program can be found at www.iot-inc.com slash training. And with that, I give you a good bed, sensible shoes, and the art of the IoT pivot with Phil Regine. With me today on the IoT show is Philip Regine. Phil is the founder and CEO of Xantheon, where he's responsible for the company's vision for senior care managing sales, business development, and technology. He has over 35 years of experience as a tech executive and entrepreneur with executive roles in enterprise design, product, and business management. Phil, welcome to the show. Nice to be here. So we've kind of known each other virtually for years now. I mean, uh, maybe three years. I think you're one of the early... Um, people that signed up for my newsletter. Is that, is that right? Is that what we, is that, that's how we connected, right? It was just through email. Yeah, it was through email. And, and I think there's a lot of groups that we belong to that are, right. that are similar. That are the same. Yeah. Uh, well, it's good to have you on the show. And I think I'm going to start off with a, a pretty broad and philosophical question. So what are the four secrets to happiness and health? Ah, I like that. <laughs> Bruce. I like that. Um, they're, they're the things you spend the most time in. Uh, your bed. Yeah. Your, yeah. Your your shoes, of course. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, your car. And, uh, <laughs> but actually, uh, low anxiety, you know, eat well, um, exercise well, and sleep well. And uh, those will keep you from getting dementia. Okay, well, dementia is dementia is something we're trying to avoid. And so it's funny because because you give like a little philosophy lesson, a little lesson on your email. Uh, this this, by the way, everyone comes from Phil's uh, what do you call it? The email footer, you know, the the little 
the note that comes at the end of the email. And I just thought it was interesting because I actually read it over a few times ago. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And you said, yeah, you spend this, those are the areas you spend the most time except for when you're walking, running, swimming, skiing, and I think hiking. Is that, is, was that the, I think that was the activities that you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you think about how much time we spend, uh, at work and sleeping, it's it's really the majority of our life. So yeah. the majority of our life is spent sitting and in bed. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's right. So, so I'll really ask you, uh, how how long have you had your bed? And I think everyone listening probably asked themselves <laughs> the same question. But how long have you had your bed? You know, I've had. I, I'm, <laughs> I've, I've been a serious athlete for years, and and. Um, which means I've had lots of back problems. That's okay. what that equates yeah. to. And so uh, I've had about 10 beds. <laughs> oh my gosh, are you serious? <laughs> oh, at least, at least. Honestly, I've been through every bed you can imagine. You know, the hard ones, the soft ones, the sleep number, the, uh-huh. you know. Um, r- right now, um, we we have, oh, I forgot the name of this. It um, comes in a blue box, um, okay. Casper. Yeah. Casper. Right now we have the Casper bed, which uh, works great for me, but it's a little bit too hard for my wife. She's a small 110 pounds and right. and uh, I'm big. So, uh, you know. So now did you get this online? Because that was my next question, because it seems like e-commerce is at least on the way of taking over the bed business. Uh, because, you know, it's so complicated when you go in to buy a bed. It's like, what? Really? <laughs> What's the differences here? And then you kind of lay on them. So did you, is that, is that, was that online or have you bought one online yet? Yeah. And it was, it was literally, okay. literally delivered the next day. No kidding. And, we, and we're on the second floor. So they delivered it. Uh-huh. They put it up. They dropped it off, unboxed it. It really? unfurled like a, like a sail. And, um, Threw it on the bed, and it's been great since. This one's been pretty good. You know, Jeez. usually the most I get out of them is a year. So uh, <laughs> I've been pretty happy with this one. It's more than a year. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you how long I've had my bed. But anyway, let's move on. It still seems to work fine. I don't I don't know. But I agree with you because if you are, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. If you're spending, and I've been trying to sleep more and more um, just for, you know, just, just in general. And, uh, so yeah, if you're spending six to eight hours, that's 25 to 33% of your time. So it totally makes sense to make that to be a huge investment. But, um, but in any case, let's, let's move on. Why don't you let everyone know, tell, tell me about your background, a little bit about yourself and your background in IOT. Well, I've, I've been around a while and, um, I suppose the, my first start in IoT was on the uh, C-17 fly-by-wire project. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. So, um, of course, it's real-time IoT, you know, in, in millisecond timings on mm-hmm. and, and our job was quality control. But um, since then, I've, I've gone through these different disciplines, including medical care, medical management, mm-hmm. and uh, quality control for AT&T. And before my parents died... I, I was working at Sun Edison, and and Sun Edison is a, a great example, or was a great example mm. of IoT because it has a lot of distributed hardware that's collecting a lot of information specifically about um, uh, edge cases like clouds and you know when it's nighttime and that kind of thing, mm-hmm. and um, and then transporting that data in real time, well actually not in real time. Uh, to a back end, so much data because mm-hmm. you know they they have used solar fields. Now this is just for everyone listening. Sun, Ed- Sun Edison is a, um, a utility company, right, for electricity. Is that yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a solar utility. Solar company. Solar utility. Okay. Right. Uh, but at one time, and may still, even with their having gone out of business, uh, have the largest amount of solar installations in the world. Mm, okay. Um, but but those come with a, a bunch of hardware um, that that fail, of course, yeah. and um, and the most expensive thing that you could uh, when you're running a business like that is a truck roll. You know, it's human. Yes, it's yes. human collateral, right? Yeah. So um, so it turns out that that's a sophisticated problem, and um, and Sun Edison did not handle it well at the time. As a matter of fact, they were taking readings every 15 minutes, and mm. it, if you, and if you think about um, clouds and how they affect solar panels and weather patterns and all that, mm-hmm. um, that you know, detecting a cloud with a 15-minute interval of data is pretty pathetic. So, um, 
that's that's kind of the start. Okay. Of, and what were they collecting? Just out of curiosity, I mean, uh, if, you know, per fifteen minutes, what were they actually collecting? Uh, ten thousand data points. No uh, kidding. Oh, okay. Uh, now you're uh, saying across ten thousand data points per installation, or that is one per installation? How how does it work out? Okay, so it works out that um, each solar panel is actually um, so they they have tens of thousands of solar panels. Sure. Right, and and they're located in fields, and those are actually um, tied to inverters, and inverters are tied to switches, which Mm go to. So each one of these is a a a potential failure point um, along along the route of the amount of electricity that's coming from that panel in a given period of time. And what what you want to know is uh, what's not working. Turns out to be the the hardest problem. Yes, Um, and. and, and you want to know how much you're getting from what you've got. So, um, so the, those 10,000 points have to do with all of that equipment. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and then the actual data from uh, the solar cells are on the panel. How much is generating, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay, makes sense. Okay. So, so you were, um, how were you involved in, in the project then? Um, I, I was hired in as a, an analyst uh, uh, originally, mm-hmm. and, um, and and then I became a product manager, and and that's really where I got my introduction to um, how to optimize um, IoT for a consumer based product. Right. So their their um, implementation, they were uh, creating a new gateway. Uh, gateway is a collection hub. Um, yes. Right. And uh, and they, their gateways ran on uh, power line control and uh, uh, Wi-Fi and cellular. And uh, mm-hmm. so they had a, a whole bunch of control on the gateway and uh, they were making their own gateway and their own software that did the controls. Oh, OK. Yeah. And uh, so the, there was the hardware implementation, which took them years. And I'm I'm guessing five to seven million for just the design and development Jeez. of it. Yeah, um, it, it could have been around four, but it, they were very poor about their economics and their numbers. <laughs> okay. um, so, uh, yeah, and these were the these were the issues that came about. Was, was how do you implement an effective IoT system? Uh, basically, a collection, and they were doing uh, HMI some some control, mm-hmm. but but it, it really it was just a cost overrun. Uh, on that project. So uh, I was the program and product manager for it um, at one point once it got into trouble. And really, my methodology was simple. Uh, Don't change things. Um, uh, Don't change any design parameters. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Get your product out the door. Um, Make sure that it meets some minimal criteria and um, and then go from there. And it, literally, I I ran interference from upper management to keep them from micromanaging the changes, changing components literally on a daily basis. So, um, yeah, and you know what that does to engineers. I mean, they never finish. <laughs> <laughs> to, some, to some extent, they love it. To another extent, they hate it. <laughs> yeah, it's so frustrating for them. You know what they really want is to have a child. <laughs> you yes. know. That's something true. they're proud of grow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyhow, yeah, that's, that was the introduction in, uh, uh, and, and that actually segued into my parents dying and, and you know, what, what you go through when that happens. And, um, and, and so I, I solved a problem. That's, okay. that's what we do today. Yeah. Now, how, how many years ago was, did you leave, uh, did you leave Edison? Uh, um, four, four years ago. Okay. So relatively recent. And then, uh, that takes us. Uh, well, 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 that's what I want to ask you. So, everyone, the reason I asked Phil on the show is that well, he's pretty much went from concept to product delivery, and we're going to find out how far along things are of an IoT product. Obviously, you've just heard he's got some uh, great experience, and then he's applied it to quite a different, quite a different market. So, that's going to be more or less at a high level what we're going to talk about. So Phil, why don't you uh, why don't you first start by telling us a little bit about your company and then and then the product direction and and sort of how you arrived there because that's I guess you know the concept or I guess ideation is where we started so maybe maybe talk to talk to us a little bit about ideation how you started and kind of how you went through that uh, process. Yeah, that's pretty interesting because uh, I had, I really did not have an intention of doing another company. I I done five and mm. I um. 
I, when I stopped working at uh, Sun Edison, I decided I'd, I'd write a book finally. Um, <laughs> and um, so I was I was in the process of doing that. But one of the people, one of the engineers that I, I managed in the in the uh, program came to me with an idea and said, I, I, I've got the engineering, but I, I don't have the ability to run a company. Would you, would you run this for me? Mm-hmm. And I, I looked at the idea and I thought, well, it, it might have some legs. And so I thought about it a while. I, I checked it out. And, and at that time, the idea was really um, how can we transport uh, data uh, with an assured delivery and uh, mm-hmm. as much as you possibly can. Um, so it, it, what he had done is uh, optimize RabbitMQ, which is a messaging platform, mm-hmm. and um, and and written uh, code to uh, roll over from uh, uh, from different delivery mechanisms. So we rolled from Wi-Fi to cellular. And and when we first started off of that, I said, okay, I'll, uh, let's give it a shot. So uh, I I took out the bankroll and and started paying money and and uh, started down the road of well, what can we do with the messaging service? I wish I'd thought of Slack actually. <laughs> um, but uh, we were talking um, to some pretty big hitters in um, in in basically IoT. That wasn't the intent at first. Mm-hmm. Um, so Ken Foster was. Um, someone that we were talking to and he said, well, you know, there's no, there's no legs in messaging. <laughs> yeah, tell that to Slack, right? <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> so uh, we actually, I started thinking, okay, there's, there's no place to go with messaging. What is a messaging platform good for? You know, I, I mean, where, where can you apply it? And at that same time, my parents were dying. Um, so I, I, and I, I had those problems that everybody has where, you know, you, you, People that you love, they they fall on the floor, and um, and and literally they they cannot push that darn button. And um, the one around their neck, you mean? I mean, yeah, um, yeah, they just don't have the energy, you know. Really? I mean, mm. fall, and and sometimes they don't want to, so it, it, it turns mm, mm, this good point. So and and they lay there for hours and hours, and I, I literally I, I moved to California to take care of my mom, so. Uh, one time she laid on the floor for eight hours. She was two rooms down from me. Couldn't hear, her, had no idea. Wake up in the morning. It makes you feel terrible and and makes them feel terrible. And you see that decay, you know, they, when they fall, they, they um, stop moving as much. And um, of course the not moving as much makes their muscles weaker, right. makes her balance less. And yeah, it's a vicious circle. You know, we, we all go through it at some time. So the point was, is how, how do we avoid going through that as much as possible? I, I, I figured we could do it with um, the backbone that we had, which was messaging. And and then it then it came down to uh, and because I'd worked on uh, program management of a gateway and communications, I had the, the background for uh, putting something together um, that was a low cost um, open architecture to meet the needs of uh, fall detection. Fall and that, detection. OK. Yeah, and really that kind of expanded because it wasn't my goal. My goal was health. So it's it's really the same as the bottom of my email. You know, okay. I I I um I think I think that things work together. And um and that when you're going to characterize a system, by the way, all these IoT systems, any system that's got a lot of parts connected, they all suffer from the same thing, which is alarm hell. <laughs> alarm hell, yes. Alarm hell. You know, what I mean, where where you where there's all these dependent things on uh, and you know the uh, functionalities that are happening, and and you get an alarm and it just cascades forever, and you know you don't know which one's the most critical and where the actual failures, and you know, I, so this is the same with human health, you know. Um, mm-hmm. and, and we're so fortunate to live in this day and age where we can uh, take AI, which is such a beautiful, uh, filtering mechanism and, and look at a large array of, of things that are happening and, and combine those in an image of what with a label that says when all of these things happen r- right now, that means that this is going to happen in just a moment. <laughs> you know, this is, yeah. this is so, um, so we get that predictive and we also get the cumulative and, and that was the main goal. 
The main goal was to take a bunch of sensors in an environment characterizing their behavior and to determine what the future holds for them and how to mitigate it. Okay, so you started out more on the messaging side and then you pivoted to say, okay, where's a good application uh, for this messaging? Kind of life kind of pointed you uh, or interest and life pointed you in the direction of health. And then in particular, because of your personal circumstances, you um, and experience, you said, yeah, fall detection and then broadening it out from there. And then you said you're basically sensing and then I'm hearing AI and I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that. Um, but is that about is that the summary of kind of how you got to uh, where Xantheon's or at least the product direction for Xantheon today? A much better summary than mine, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So, so you sense the environment, and then when you collect the data. Now, you mentioned AI, so I want to ask you um, first of all, because we're going to be starting a series, uh, or we, I guess, depending on when we play, we will have played a series on AI. But I like to ask you: You're looking at AI for predictive now. How would you characterize AI versus analytical models? to be able to do the predictions or did you not even look at the two and you just chose AI, a uh, cognitive model? No, no, no. We start with, we start with uh, the analytical models. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and our AI is in its infancy, but, sure. but so, so what, how this, how this happens is the first thing that you have to do whenever there's a signal, you know, no matter what signal and all signals follow the same paradigm, you know, they have their frequency, they have amplitude and they have noise, right? <laughs> right? So, so your your goal is is to smooth out the signal so that you you don't have any noise. Which you know, and this turns out to be another difficult problem because every time you take something away, you might be taking something that's mm-hmm. valuable away. Mm-hmm. So, um, and 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 then to determine what those amplitudes and frequencies mean out of that signal. So um, that, that turns out to be the analytics part of it. And, okay. um, and, and given that information, you can characterize an amazing amount about your environment. The, 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 so for an example of that um, uh, might be, uh, it, actually we use this for a bed exit alarm, which I, I really like. So there, and, and fall detection. So it, fall detection is is more complex than you might think because um, people all walk differently, and especially mm-hmm. as you get older, you might be in a walker, mm-hmm. and your walk might be very slow, and um, and your fall might be incredibly slow. You you, you may you know, <laughs> it could be like a crumble, or it could be a yeah, yeah. You, know, you might lean against the wall, you might slowly collapse. Right, I mean, right, right. so there's there's all the characterizing that becomes a difficult issue. You know, that the one thing that is for sure after they fall is that they, is it a really critical fall is they don't move afterwards. Mm. Okay. So, so w- what you see when you have um, sensors is a sequence of events, mm-hmm. but if you just thresholded, which is old style um, analysis of, of signals is, and if on the C-17, exactly how it works, actually, is, mm-hmm. is that you you have a signal and you say, okay, I, I expect an amplitude, you know, how, how big it is mm-hmm. to be this, a max and a min. You throw out the noise and then you look for things that are outside your window of operation. And when something happens outside your window of operation, you go, boom, that's a problem, you know, and then you, you scream to it, right? Um, of course, it, you know, it, if someone jumps down off of a step, that looks a heck of a lot like a fall. You know, I mean, let's say, or if you uh, drop down and do a push up, you know, that looks like a fall. Um, so, in order to be accurate, you need to couple events together, and that turns out to be the analytics. Uh, so that's what we did. We started off with an analytics model that that uh, smoothed um, the signal. Mm-hmm. Um, looked for amplitude and frequency, correlated that to behavior, and um, and then it took multiple events, each each event meaning a characterization of behavior, like a walk, a fall, a stay in place, a slight movement, a bed exit, you know, like a little tiny, you know, you're, you're, when you're breathing, you have this accelerometer event, you know, in your bed. Mm-hmm. 
And, and then, you know, if you get out of bed, you don't get that accelerometer event with the same frequency and amplitude. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, um, then if you don't get back in bed and it's dark, you know, we figure something's wrong. Um, so that that's the basis of the analytics. The problem with that is that it, it's not comprehensive enough. And uh, and so that's why you go towards AI. Um, you go towards AI because you want to go. Okay, look. Uh, given their oxygen and you know their their blood pressure and and uh, their activity beforehand and their heart rate. Uh, now when they uh, when they drop down and do it, oh, they're dropping down and doing a push up, right? Because you know there's all these factors involved that characterize that behavior. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So what you're you're and just for everyone listening and and uh, Phil, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're talking amplitude and frequency and you're just generalizing because all sensors, uh, I guess, one dimensional sensors are going to be analog to start. And so they're going to have um, they're going to have an analog signal and that's going to be a signal. If you plot it over one dimension over time, then it's going to be up and down and just how big it goes up and how big it goes down. And then depending on what the sensor is, it just means different things. Right. So you're, you're generalizing um, amplitude and, and frequency for all types of different types of. Of sensors, just it, right, yeah, yeah, exactly right, right. I mean, okay. audio and video fall into those yeah. categories, right? And, and then it turns out to be a a, um, a linear algebra problem, you know, where you mm-hmm. transform dimensions into a single, you know, multiple dimensions into a single dimension, and then how do you deal with it? Yeah, and and hopefully transform it into a dimension that's of use that you can you can pull some interesting data out of. And so it sounds like. That's the analytical part. So you're prepping up the data. You're kind of removing the the signal from the noise or removing the noise from the signal, depending on how you want to think about it. And then you're saying you're using AI to then do, I guess, very sophisticated pattern matching. Is that a fair way to characterize it at a high level, the, the way you're using the AI? I think it's a very fair way. The 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 way that and and right now since we're in our infancy, I I, I can give you an idea of, of how we're doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's features in the target. The the features are are what components of the data um, mean something. And um, a, lo- a lot of times it could be raw data and then a, a calculated piece of data and then and and in, an example of that with an accelerometer might be the. the X, Y, and Z axis over a period of time. And at the same time, you're getting the X, Y, and Z axis, mm-hmm. you're, you're showing their oxygen level. And right. right? And it, so, and usually with accelerometers, you use a, a vector form, which is actually all three axes combined. So you'd have X, Y, Z and a vector, mm-hmm. the oxygen level. Okay. So that's a, that's a simple example. And then, and then with, with these three features, you, we actually use a labeling system it within our software. So we confirm all events with human behavior. So uh, what does that mean? It means that if something happens, so in our world, someone responds to it. If someone asks for help, mm-hmm. someone automatically falls. If someone soils their diaper, if someone, you know, all of these things have someone going to it. And then they're, they're, they actually confirm whether what they what the machine said or what the person said happened and uh, and that puts a label on that event right okay. so mm-hmm. and and so once you put a label on that event and you bookend a period of time then you've got what's necessary to do some some ai on it which is which is really uh, the nature of the filtering like you said mm-hmm. okay so yeah and just to, to to go down a little bit further and then we'll pop back up We've got the three, just in this example, we've got the three dimensions of the accelerometer and then, I don't know, another one, two, three dimensions for the breathing. That gives you a multidimensional kind of, well, I like thinking about these as shapes. So that's just how I think. So yeah. you've got a shape yeah. and then you then correlate that shape because there always is cause and effect. And the way you do it is you correlate it with an event. And then what the AI is doing is saying, well, if I recognize this shape again, then I'm predicting this event's going to occur. Is that a, is that a good way of saying it? Perfect, perfect. And if you think about you know what the, what that means is that you have to have a lot of data, right? Which is yes. a big data thing, right? So yeah. so uh, yeah, what you what you want to do is have as many examples uh, leading to that, so that the filtering device can find those things that you visually or analytically wouldn't be able to notice. Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, well, we won't get into that right now unless you have some strong thoughts about it. But this is also this can also be done with analytics. So you know you can use an analytical model to do pattern matching in multiple dimensions. But now we're seeing more cognitive models that are being used again to do this pattern matching, but with uh, yeah, I guess you have to say a different way. And I and I don't know when one way is better than the other way. And I don't know when speed. I think speed is also kind of something that has to be considered here. But this is kind of the transition, and it sounds like you've been researching in, into this. Or, so maybe uh, talk to us a little bit about the transition from analytical models and the cognitive models and, and kind of, I don't know if you've, if you've uncovered this yet, but when one works better than the other. Yeah, and I haven't uncovered it. So, um, so at, at this point in time, um, we recognize that what we really want is a predictive model. Yeah. And, um, and it, it's, it's one thing to, um, to identify and it's another thing to predict. So um, we're, we're not far off enough along that curve for mm -hmm. me to give you anything conclusive on it. I, okay. I can say that the, the, the analytics, um, you know, this is, there's a lot of companies pursuing all of this at the same time. Sure. And uh, none of us are really uh, hitting a mark that's even close to um, natural language processing. You know, I mean, which nowadays is at 97, 98 mm -hmm. percent. So um, that, that that is what our goal needs to be is is 98 uh, percent effective identification and prediction. Yeah, no, that makes sense. OK, so you um, you have the product idea. And maybe just talk to us about the sources of data. And then I'm going to ask kind of like the next step is how you, you know, move from there to the application code and the rest of that. But I'm getting that you're sensing the room. I'm getting that you're sensing the human. That's at a very high level. Um, can you maybe just take us through what your digitization? So in other words, uh, yeah, what, how have you digitized the environment? Okay, so um, uh we designed for specifically to address um, adding uh, sensors of, of any type, uh, hopefully any type. Um, so uh, originally you start with simple sensors, which in in our case is um, accelerometers, uh, barometric pressure, light. Um, and um, mm -hmm. you, you, you take the, those sensors basically um, – and there's a great program uh, – that Google offers. Uh, it's called Science um, Science Notebook. It's an Android app. Hmm. It's fantastic for kids, really. Uh, and, and just people in general. Um, it allows you to use. You know, our phones have like fifteen sensors on them. They're they're amazing. Um, and it, it allows you to tap into those sensors and see oh, cool. the uh, the actual what is going on at any point in time. You know, in, in other words, it, it shows you the frequency and amplitude, hmm. and um, and, and naturally, it's it all has to do with measurement. You know how how often it measures, but you know you just see a, a line going up and down. <laughs> you know? um, and and uh, that that's really how we start. You know, we st we start with simple sensors that um, have a line going up and down, and then we we characterize that line going up and down, uh, finding the frequency and the amplitude, mm -hmm. and um, and we collect that data. And in our case. Um, we currently collect through BLE. We determined um, that it was probably a, the the best protocol for us for power at the time. So th this turns out to be the IoT conundrum. The IoT conundrum is um, if it's connected, it's no big deal. It's simple, Simon. Um, but if it's not connected, if it's not connected to a power source, uh, then then you're dealing with batteries, and now you're into the you're into the problem, you know. So uh, the the problem is is um, how can I characterize an environment with enough data uh, from a battery source? Because that's distance of of um, signal transport, mm -hmm. and a BLE it turns out to to be the lowest power signal transport for the distance um, that's adopted by the most number of people, you know? Um, and it has a pretty good bandwidth too. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is a pretty, I'd have to say immature um, communication protocol because it doesn't really handle the handoff, you know, the mm. connect and reconnect very well. That, that all has to be programmed 
um, by the people that are doing it. And, and the new mesh, I think, is much better at that, but we really haven't gotten into that very far. Um, and then just to, just to clarify, you're using the Bluetooth on the humans, but not necessarily in the rooms, or is it also in the rooms? No, no, no. We use Wi-Fi. Okay, so okay. In the, so the, well, we use sensors, period, right, in the room on the person. But I mean the powering, the, the sensors well, that are powered by battery are on the human or also in the room itself? No, no, no. They're they're on the human unless it's some uh, yeah. inter, in, intermittent sensor, you know, that someone's decided, you know, like they they can't run a power source to it because it's it's been uh, okay. glued to the ceiling or something, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah. So a perfect example of that is is um, is an, an environmental sensor that that checks for, you know, poisons in the air. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, one one form or another. So uh, there, there's a bunch of those out there right now, and and for those, um, they write to uh, a web address, and then we we take that, we put it on our messaging platform, um, and our messaging platform transports data both ways, um, and our our an analytics for a, immediate representation of an event mm-hmm. is all performed on the gateway. So the gateway is a hub. It could be a phone. Um, in our case, we use uh, Android, a- the Android operating system, uh, which can run on uh, phones, uh, watches, um, Android TVs. And um, and w- we use that uh, gateway to collect data from the BLE or, or from mm-hmm. a, a Wi-Fi connection. Um, we use a, a rapid transport connector, which which means that uh, basically a publish subscribe to a queue. So there's no um, an analysis between um, the the uh, the piece of data mm-hmm. and, the, and uh, the the gateway. In other words, it's it's just a it drops it off in a mailbox and someone picks it up. Uh, okay. Okay, yeah. and just to, just to you know, just to add a bit more, I guess, uh, shine a little brighter light on this. Uh, what Phil's talking about is we've got a sensor, and let's say it's a breathing sensor, however that's being sensed. And well, we got to get the data. We got to get the data up to the cloud. And so the gateway that Phil's referring to here would be either a watch or it'd be the phone. Which so the connection would be the Bluetooth from the let's say the breathing sensor to the watch or the phone, and then the phone, which is where I think you're going to go now, then has to connect up to the internet, right? So you so then that's going to have to connect up. I'm guessing through Wi-Fi, or is that is that the next step? Uh, okay, so um, or cellular, right? Or cellular, true. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. yeah. So um, which to 5G? I'm really looking forward to that. Which makes actually a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so it's exactly right. So you can imagine any piece of data. Um, we do 22 messages a second. Um, those are those are transported to a, a mailbox. Um, mm-hmm. uh, the gateway. Uh, it's either transported to the the gateway. Pulls it off of the mailbox. It's either transported directly to the gateway or it's, it goes to a mailbox. And, then, and what do you mean by mailbox? Um, the mailbox is the messaging system. You know, just okay. someplace where mm-hmm. it's um, collecting. Yeah, you just you're you're connected to it all the time, and you're just waiting for it. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, so once the gateway gets the data, then it goes through its analytics um, to combine those sensor pieces of information and the events to. Uh, to determine whether or not there's an alarm that needs to be set. Oh, so this analytics is all happening. We'll call it on the edge. So it's, you're not doing it in the cloud. All your all your analytical, I won't say all, but at least these these analytical operations are happening locally on on what you're calling the gateway. That's pretty much on the body, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. uh, no. No. Actually. No? Um, so yes and no. Okay. Okay. Um, once again, we always you always go back to um, a mobility. So if let, let's say you're in an assisted living community um, and you're an old person, then you're wearing sensors or they're plugged into the walls around you, mm-hmm. and um, and and then you have a permanent gateway, which in our case is an Android TV, and that's plugged into a wall somewhere. Okay, um, and and then that collects 
data from the sensors that are around. That person moves, if, if they have a mobile sensor, they move from one gateway to the other, right? Because the distance of travel. Nice, nice. 250 okay. meters, right? Which turns out to be the problem with BLE, right? Is that then you have to have a really robust handoff and hand-on thing. Um, so it's going then from the phone to this Android TV. Is that what you're saying? Or, it's going or is it to, just skipping the phone altogether? It got, yeah, it goes from the the... It goes from the sensor to the Android TV. Okay, makes it, sense. All right. Okay. So, but that could run on a phone as it runs on an Android TV or, or a watch. Or for that right? matter, a, a full Android system running on a watch. Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. got it. Okay, so uh, and then, so then the that gateway, it's an edge device. Mm-hmm. It has the uh, analytic machinery, which is actually uh, pulled to it. The configuration, what it's going to, what sensors it's going to connect to, which will allow it to connect to, which is the security issue, right? We we Mm -hmm. not allow a sensor to be connected without it having been configured with a MAC address and a login. In other words, we require security encryption for us to Mm -hmm. talk to the darn thing. And so uh, that's all brought down from the server in a configuration when the gateway logs in, and then it checks for updates every once in a while. Uh, Mm That, that it looks for those sensors, and when the sensor comes into the environment, it, it latches onto it, locks that sensor down with a BLE, and uh, starts pulling data from it at 22 messages a second. Then, it, okay. then each one of those sensors it's pulling data from, the gateway is, and then it's analyzing that data um, to see w- what's going on with respect to um, that person in their environment. Okay. And then, okay. then it creates an event, and... Uh, all data is moved back and forth through that messaging system. So we have raw data channels and we have event channels. Um, and uh, those, those event channels are listened to uh, specifically by either the gateway so that it can connect to other people's software mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and or um, by uh, clients, which are people that have mobile phones that are responding to an event. Okay, so you're you're interpreting the data locally, let's call it locally on the the gateway. So we'll call it the edge, although you know we could we could um, that's kind of a fluid term. And then the events you're talking about are kind of like oh bed exit or fall detection. And then if these events occur, then you're going to have rules that are going to say well if this if someone exited their bed, then maybe you send a text message to to their loved one, or maybe if someone falls, you you send you know some other messages. Is that kind of how it works? It, exactly. Yeah. It, we um we d- we don't actually send the message. They they pull it. But um, okay. right. All right. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And then and then there's a, a response mechanism, which this goes to the quality control that comes. I've been doing quality control. Well, I guess everybody in software has since uh. Mm-hmm. Uh, early 90s. So uh, originally it was for Intel on their their ISO 9000 push into Europe. And um, the, the nature of all quality control loops is uh, non-conformity, which we call an event. Um, and then that non-conformity is, fo- is followed up with uh, a, an established criteria to find the systemic cause of it. And then once you've identified the systemic cause of the, of the non-conformity, then you have a protocol for for fixing that, um, mm-hmm. it's back to the medical management software, <laughs> yep. you know, uh, that then you, that, that protocol for fixing it is then applied against the event. And then you check, uh, repeatedly over a period of time to see what the effectiveness of the protocol is. And then those protocols change and you slowly, um, modify your effectiveness, enhance your effectiveness for the initial event and create rules that is, that make it so the event doesn't happen. So that's the exact same thing we do. You know, we, we, we which I think is um, how almost all companies these days that are, that are worth their salt are, are dealing with um, any kind of event in their system, you know, which like, let's say a non-delivery event in warehousing or something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the protocols, just to be clear for everyone, uh, we don't want to conflate that with the technical protocols. We're no. talking about the the actions or what you do when you when when you interpret this information. Exactly. Thanks a lot for clarification. 
Yeah. Okay. And so we've, we're collecting a lot of internal data. Are you using any external data sources? Are you connecting up to any microservice uh, services or is it all pretty much local? No, no, no. We do do that. And what, and okay. really that, that connection is through uh, that messaging system. Mm-hmm. See, see that it all goes down to that initial, <laughs> that, uh, that initial decision to start the company with the guy that had a messaging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're using the heck out of it then. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So basically two lines of code connects um, anybody's data uh, to a mailbox messaging uh-huh. that yeah. has a queue connected to it that is configured for any device and or person. Okay. And so what other, what sources of external data are you connecting to just out of curiosity? Well, right now, right now we're just looking at um, environmental sensors that are, um, you know, like uh, CO2 and that kind of thing. Okay. And all right. So this would still be within the environment, wouldn't it? Like I'm talking about, are you, are you connected up to the weather channel, for example, see what the temperature is outside or a darn good idea, Bruce. I'm going to use that. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Okay. All right. So we're collecting all the data now. Um, Let's talk about. So you, it, it sounds like you you obviously were thinking about this top down, or, or maybe maybe oh, it's not obvious. But no, ahead. no, it, top down. You know, I, I, some of it has been grown from the bottom, but I've been around a long time, so um, it, it means that well, people like us that have been writing mm-hmm. software and solving problems for years and years. Um, what what makes us valuable is is the fact that we can predict the future. You know, meaning <laughs> yeah, that, that, that uh, well, we've done it for so long that we have some inkling of what they might actually need that they haven't thought of. <laughs> you know? right, we've got some pretty good AI or predicted or analytical uh, models to to uh, interpret our our environment and make a prediction as well. Yeah, exactly. Really, that's what we're doing. And and um, so top down, uh, uh, our design has not changed. It's a pretty robust design for three mm-hmm. years. Um, and uh, we're, we're just building it out and uh, it takes a while. IOT is not, um, there's a lot of problems with it. And, um, and you, you know, those problems all basically circle around um, the limitations in technology. You know, that's. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's right. So talk to us a little bit now. You, I mean, you work top down and this is the right way to go. Um, What's the value we're creating? What's the information we need? Okay, then to create that information, what's the data we need to collect? Now, the next step is going to be, you know, kind of how we're going to collect that data and then how we're going to transform it. So how did you go about choosing your technical components? Because as you said, I, IoT is pretty complicated. And the reason it's complicated is because it's a big old system of systems and you need to integrate all these pieces together. How did you go about choosing which vendor to go with and and what technology to use? What, what were your what was your what were your constraints or your filters in doing that? Oh, great question! Great question. Uh, first thing was uh, financial constraints. So, okay. yeah. <clears throat> so to be competitive against the big boys, um, and and there are big players in this market. Um, it, it means that you have to have a cost structure um, that doesn't just keep expanding, and. Um, the way that small companies uh, get an expanding cost structure is um, they they use what is seemingly a low cost item on a a, a per unit basis mm-hmm. um, that consumes their company um, as it scales. So uh, you know examples of that are are um, if if I were to use um, the built-in servers uh, from from Amazon, mm-hmm. um, rather than uh, the the bare bones servers, um, I, I have to pay an additional charge or per unit of of CPU, mm-hmm. and um, and it, it just eats you up. So, right. anytime you you choose to purchase someone something from somebody else that has a value added to it, you're you're adding to your costs when when you're a uh, a small company, um, you're balancing uh, time to delivery uh, against your cost structure. So we, all of our technology is 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 based on those decisions of that balance point. Um, there's a lot of really good open source software out there 
today. Mm. Mm. Um, but Postgres is an awesome database. It is a, it is a great database. Um, Postgres? Postgres, yeah. Okay, uh, we'll put that in the show analysis notes. Yeah. Um, the, the reason it's a great database is, is because it's pretty darn fast. It's um, open architecture. Our, our design uh, specifically allowed segmentation of users. So if you think about what we're delivering to, even if we're delivering to uh, cities and counties, which is our, our last goal, uh, mm-hmm. um, you're, you're delivering to 50,000 people at a shot. Um, but, but the way that the county looks at their data is from their county perspective. You're not rolling up all the counties in the world, you know? Um, so that means that you can segment your servers and, um, and your applications based on that county, that company. Mm-hmm, center. Mm-hmm. Um, so as long as you have a uh, scalability within that, within that county, um, then, then you're good. Right. So for us, um, we made sure that our messaging platform could handle uh, a million messages uh, a second. Um, and, and that, that's why we chose rabbit MQ. So there are, um, there are better. I mean, there are messaging platforms out there that handle 60, 60 million, um, mm-hmm. but uh, they don't guarantee delivery. And, um, and in other words, you have to do the code, to guarantee delivery, which means that you that you, you basically um, have to put a promise on your transactions. Well, um, it, you know, you never get something for nothing, and and so uh, for us, uh, using RabbitMQ, open open source uh, messaging with uh, high bandwidth, um, guaranteed delivery um, was was a good decision. Then we use Postgres for our database. We use Postgres for a lot of different reasons. One is we can create new instances um, with the right configuration. It's very scalable. Um, it, it's it's built for SQL. There's lots of packages mm-hmm. to expand it um, so that uh, if you do have uh, performance problems other than hardware costs, um, you know, just expanding your hardware, um, you can you can get it to deliver. Um, it's got uh, geo uh, uh, geolocation, you know, um, which mm-hmm. is it, uh, it's got PostGIS, which is uh, a um, service for uh, geolocating things, geofencing for senior care. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a company called Timescale DB that um, I really like this company. Uh, the guys that run this company, they're pretty new, but these guys are on the ball. They they definitely definitely are trying to deliver a quality product. It's got a few little glitches in it right now, but from the perspective of aggregation, rapid ag- aggregation, 20,000 times faster than some natural Postgres, po- Postgres uh, SQL aggregates. Um, wow. It's a really solid product. Um, so so let, me, let me just stop you there just to, to yeah. digest uh, what you've been telling us. So going back to... I guess your high level uh, filters or constraints when you're looking at the technology made up a great point, and that is financial constraints. And then in there, you are saying, "Eh, take a look at the business model, because it may be pretty cheap to start with, but then it may get pretty onerous. So you have to be careful with the business model. You also made the point that open source, there's a lot of really good open source out there. So you don't necessarily have to be buying um, all commercial software. And then you kind of moved into the platform. And originally, I was thinking RabbitMQ was a protocol. Maybe it is a protocol, but it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's also an IoT platform is, is what you're saying. Is that correct? Uh, no, it's a, it's a mess. It's not. It's a messaging okay. platform. And it, specifically, it's a, um, a packaging of AMQP and uh and, and some of the other um, messaging protocols. Um, so a messaging protocol, are you differentiating that from an IoT, uh, sorry, a messaging platform, are you differentiating that from an IoT platform? Or absolutely. Or are they synonymous? Okay. A- absolutely, yeah. Uh, so talk to us about the differences. Um, okay, so an IoT platform, they, uh, so messaging is, is how you um, – how you transport data? It's the application protocol. I mean, if you know, one way of thinking about it, it's the application protocol 
um, yeah, that is doing the communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah, just think of it as a a, a wire, you know, um, a, a wire in a storage location, like a bucket or mm-hmm. a, you know a pipe in a in a, a container. Um, but but an IoT platform that has a lot to do with provisioning and maintenance. Um, so so when you think about IoT. Um, if we go back to the old days with computers and companies, they would have to install thousands of computers, and they'd have to know what computer went with who, and you know, and uh, what was the version of software on it, and you know, what mm-hmm. who did they buy it from, and you know, and if it broke, you know, what you know, what is their um, contract maintenance contract on it, and you know, uh, all that stuff, right? So. That that's really provisioning, right? Is, yeah. is it, and for IoT, it's a hundred times worse than that. Yeah, we still have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's that's the big, that's the big cheese right there. That's where the problem is, you know. And when someone talks about IoT, uh, it does not matter at all if they don't have provisioning and maintenance, because in fact, your problem is going to be, I handed out a hundred sensors to a hundred old people. Mm-hmm. They all went to lunch. And four of them were playing with the sensors uh, together, you know, flipping them and, you know, dropping their drinks and whatever they were doing. And um, and then they mixed them all up. Right. You know? OK, so now they all leave and they have each other's each other's. Yeah. Right. And um, and then one threw one in the trash. And OK, so basically, <laughs> you know. You've got to be able to identify whether they got the right sensor and yeah, and yeah. what sensors are working and what sensors aren't working and how to swap them back and forth and who have you given them to and what was the cost of them and what was the version of them and yeah, you know, what's the very important, yeah. all that stuff right that's provisioning and the maintenance right that is an IoT platform an IoT platform mm-hmm. is provisioning maintenance messaging and delivery of events you know and if uh, if it's not doing that it's not doing anything. In my okay. No, I like that. I like that. Um, talk to us now a little bit about security. Now, you've you've talked about the authentication part of it, and uh, and so there's there's a there's a source of authentication, and then there's also going to be some encryption. Uh, maybe just 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 at a high level uh, because we're winding down here. But just just give us your thoughts on security and and what role it played during the design and development of your system. Um, I, I have a philosophy on that, like I have on everything, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> but, um, you, you just do the best you can. Um, okay. yeah. you know, it's, it's a can of worms. It always will be. So, um, and it's never ending. Yeah. It's never ending. Uh, you could spend every resource of your company trying to address that issue and, and you would never address it. Right. Um, you, you would claim you did though. Um, so, uh, you take the community standards, whatever they are. At the at the time that you're implementing something, uh, you do your best to implement those standards um, with the revenue structure, or the cost structure that you have. Meaning, you know, um, set a budget, uh, mm-hmm. determine uh, the the highest viable bar that you can achieve with that budget. Um, use the standards that are 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 currently being pushed by you know your your technical community and. Um, and and then move on, you know. So um, it, let's take example of the video camera, right? Um, yeah, well, don't buy your video cameras from no names, you know, uh, in China. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, make sure that you have, you know, and these are normal things. These are normal things. Who doesn't check the login of their devices? <laughs> you know, I mean, come on. <laughs> Everyone or a lot I mean, of people. I mean, I know yeah. everybody's throwing the stuff out there, but anybody that's been in the business a while, all of us, you know, I sure. mean, we, we yeah. all. The, the, yeah. Those table sticks. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, just do what's right. You know, just okay. follow the rules, you know, make sure that you have, you know, uh, the, you know, that, that it knows the device, you know, that, it, in other words, you know, the piece of information, you know, what I know, who I know and what he has. Right. It's it. Yeah. So um, just uh, so we do all that. Right. And yeah, from the beginning, you know, actually, mm-hmm. the guy that pulled me into the company, it was his greatest effort was mm-hmm. to make sure that the messaging platform was secure. Was secure. Yeah. 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 I like that. Do the best you can, because it is an open ended problem. And. You know, and I think what you're talking about, and I don't know if you did it um, uh, directly or if it was more indirectly, but you're you're really talking about risk management in the sense of how much risk are you willing to tolerate? You use the 
the constraint or the the level of community standards and then you know you can do this formally or informally but yeah you have to get something out there you need to do the best you can and and right now security is not one of those items that people are 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 require uh, are paying more for and so you have to you have to balance that now there's going to be issues in terms of uh, GDPR that's going to be coming up in Europe and how you use the data, but I don't want to go in there. How I want to, um, I guess, wrap things up is ask you about your challenges. What are the what are the biggest challenges you're facing right now? Uh, where you are right now? Uh, where we are right now, I'm I'm dealing with uh, packaging. Um, okay. So uh, we we buy sensors from um, anybody really. Yeah. Uh, we we don't make our own. Um, and then we have to package those sensors. And honestly, it's not something that, uh, that we're good at, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, we're, we're dealing with, um, putting those sensors in, in plastic packages, you know, and making it so that they're usable. Um, seems like a small problem, but actually it's a big deal. No, 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 that's not a small problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, we deal with battery life and a uh, form factor. So, uh, we've, we've been through the many iterations on this and, um, and we're finally coming down to um, uh, a form factor that's got a larger battery um, on it, and um, and I, 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 for the wearable sensors, um, and the these batteries are the CR twenty four fifties. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, those uh, those round uh, the, the the flat round ones. Right? Yeah, as a poor, as opposed to the CR twenty thirty twos. Okay, so oh boy. Okay. there mm-hmm. there's a significant difference in the size. Um, you know, a third again the size, but yeah. but um, it turns out that that the that size differential is still easily wearable. It's light and it's conformable. So, sure. So um, and lasts a lot longer. And lasts. <laughs> Yeah, uh, maybe eight times as long. So it's wow. yeah, it's a big deal. Um, the other thing is, so we've changed that. Um, that's that's helping a lot. Uh, there's little issues with that. Actually, that's why the um, repackaging of you know finding a package for mm. become a big deal because the mm-hmm. the push button on it's in a different location. Um, mm-hmm. The the next thing we're doing that's our big challenge is um, that we we now are using. Um, Android watches, so um, full Android watches, not mm. um, not the new uh, Google O. I, they just relabeled their. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, I think they call it Oware or Osware. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyhow, we use a full Android watch um, for specifically for uh, geofencing. Um, so that that's an implementation right now. That's a challenge. Um, we're uh, we're challenged by geofencing, in fact, um, because you you need to be able to oh yeah. and uh, indoor positioning systems. So really, it comes down to the same thing that have been the challenges for the last three years, <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> which is yeah. uh, power. <laughs> yep, yep. and uh, indoor positioning. <laughs> you know, that kind of yeah, that, that's a pretty good summary, isn't it? Yeah, that's like uh, the world of of wearables, really. You know, uh, yeah, like that. yeah. So same challenges as everybody else. Uh, but you know, their solutions are are uh, fast and furious, and uh, I, I I love technology today. Unbelievable! It's unbelievable. Yeah, no, it comes across. It does come across. Well, Phil, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed our conversation. Can you let everybody know how to find out more about you, your company, uh, whatever what, you know, whatever, whatever you want to communicate? Um, yeah, uh, you can find us at www.xanthian.com. I'll put in the show notes. Okay. And uh, our, our goal is uh, to provide value um, to our communities. Uh, we never provide value um, at someone else's expense, which means um, I don't ever want to sell a product um, and make money off of someone that doesn't provide uh, greater than or equal to value. And and this is uh, our representation of what we think America is supposed to be. I, yeah. Uh, we will always provide more functionality at the exact same initial cost that you purchased into the product at. So, which is the beauty of IoT. It is. Yeah, uh, it we is. can add at no cost. And, yeah, uh, yeah, over the air, make sure that's designed as well, right from the beginning, but have your your OTA mechanism. But, uh, but I like it. Are you looking for 
any partners or are you looking for any people? I don't know. Yeah, no, I'd love to. That is by far the hardest challenge in the Valley. First of all, finding people that are actually competent across the technology Mm. stack. That is hard because they get snapped up by Google and Yahoo. Um, so uh, that that has been we'd, I'd love to find a new CTO. I constantly have to um, have to trade off between uh, business and uh, technology, and uh, it would be better if I could just focus on business. Um, and uh, you know, anytime that there's a competent engineer, uh, we, we're interested. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, everyone's heard that. Yeah. If you're interested in this space, then uh, contact Phil and. And I'm sure there's a contact mechanism on your website. Right? Of course there is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I very much enjoyed the conversation and it's excellent because this was kind of, I won't say gorilla, but it was kind of real life uh, reality. How do you put together a product? You did a pivot and I'm sure that was only one of the pivots you mentioned and probably pivoted a number of other times. And uh, yeah, it was enjoyable to listen to the, I guess the pathway And obviously, we could have spent a lot more time, but thank you uh, for your time. Thank you, Bruce, and really enjoyable to uh, finally meet you, and uh, nice to hear your talk, and a good talk. Thanks a lot, and best of luck, of course. Okay. Well, that was episode 102. I like the number, even though it has a 17 in it. To get analysis of this episode, links to anything that was mentioned in the shows, plus the transcript, just go to the show analysis notes, all of which can be found at iot-inc.com slash podcasts. You can go to the show analysis notes and get the PDF, or you can sign in or register with iotinc.com with the long form. And if you do that with the long form, you get access to all the PDFs from all the podcasts, all the videos, and the special reports that I've in there. There's probably some other goodies in there too. It's called Bruce's Private Reserve. If you've been enjoying this podcast, subscribe. That way you can get every episode delivered straight to your device. There are three ways that you can support this podcast. You can share it on your blog, personal or company, if you found the information in it valuable. You can share it on social just by clicking on the show analysis notes. And then within there, there's some social widgets or Twitter, LinkedIn. Those are the two that I socialize in. Or the big one, you can leave a rating or review on iTunes. Just go to, this is a shortcut, but just go to iot-inc.com slash iTunes and it'll give you instructions. It just takes one click to leave a rating and a little bit longer if you want to write your thoughts. The podcast is free, but as mentioned at the beginning of the episode, The way you can support it financially is to buy the ICIP online training program if you think it's right for you. I'm your host, Bruce Sinclair. Thank you for listening. Until next time, may your path to IoT business be a circuitous one. You have been listening to the IoT Inc. Business Show. 